Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guests today are Kobe Castile, Assistant Professor of Law at Tel Aviv University, and Yoro Neely, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Wisconsin. We'll be discussing their article, The Giant Shadow of Corporate Gadflies, which is forthcoming in the Southern California Law Review. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Kobe, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, and your own, welcome back to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. So your article is about shareholder proposals in the context of publicly traded firms. And I wondered if before we get into the meat and bones of the piece, if we can maybe set the picture a little bit. Could you tell us what the role of the shareholder proposal in corporate governance is? What impacts can proposals have and what kinds of investors submit them? I think it's really an important thing to start with setting that backdrop. And maybe the starting point should be understanding how much of a limited voice many shareholders have in corporate America, and especially small retail investors, really, they can vote, but other than that, their interaction with the companies in which they hold shares is very limited. And the shareholder proposal tool actually allows them one very meaningful way of having that voice in the corporate decision-making. And the way this actually works out is that shareholder proposals allow shareholders that meet some threshold requirements to put proposals that they drafted in the materials that the company sends to shareholders and then to have those voted on in a precatory manner, in a non-binding manner at the annual meeting. So those can range from proposals to change some of the governance practices of the company, like separating the CEO and the chair positions, or like declassifying the board, all the way to social responsibility, uh, omissions, carbon footprint, and diversity issues. And the important thing is that putting those proposals for a vote basically forces the issue into the spotlight, having a discussion about it. Management needs to respond to those proposals. They'll voice their opinion. Then shareholders will put their vote in and you can see how much support those proposals get. And that can nudge companies to move, even if it's not a mandatory proposal. Now, Kobe will elaborate a little bit more. The last 20 years saw a development that make proposals much more effective than they used to be. And that uh, has really set the stage to what our paper is tackling with the gadflies. So one important factor to, to bear in mind is that shareholder proposals are not binding, meaning that even if they pass, the company is not required to implement them. But in reality, shareholder proposals do have some power, successful proposals. And the way it works is that if a, a precatory proposal is a pass and the company chooses to ignore this proposal, then proxy advisors, such as the ISS or glass Lewis, will recommend voting against uh, the directors of the company who uh, intentionally choose to ignore the proposals. And when directors receive a negative vote recommendation, there is a high likelihood that a lot of shareholders will follow that a proxy advisor recommendation. And this can have significant consequences or impact on these directors' career or the ability to continue serving on the board. So suddenly we have a non-binding proposals that become quasi-binding just because of uh, the mechanism I uh, described. And shareholders have used this tool uh, successfully in the past. There were a bunch of uh, shareholders that were advised by Harvard Law School a clinical program, the Shareholder Right Projects, who uh, conducted a very successful campaign to declassify board, to eliminate staggered board through the use of the shareholder proposal mechanism. Uh, the New York uh, City Controller had a successful campaign about proxy access and gender diversity, again, through the use of this shareholder proposal mechanism. Your article has a really interesting and thought-provoking title, The Giant Shadow of Corporate Gadflies. It's almost evocative of maybe Socrates in a boardroom or wearing a suit. I wondered if you could tell us just who are corporate gadflies and if you could give us a little bit of a history of their role in shareholder activism and maybe just some color on who they are as people. What motivates them and uh, leads them to become corporate gadflies? 
The term gadfly is really is drawing from ancient Greek where, you know, the, the expression was really derived from this pesky fly that really doesn't stop till their voice is heard in the sense uh, going and continuing lobbying for stuff. And in the corporate context, we see this group of individuals, really a handful of individuals, where you can count them on two hands, not more than 10 of them, that have been uh, taking that role very seriously. They have been submitting proposals year over year to companies on various subjects and really getting a reputation for being those type of Don Quixote shareholders who go against the big corporate machine, so to speak. And historically, they are all people who have unique characters. Evelyn Davis, who recently passed away, was really notorious for the way she approached those annual meetings. She would show up dressed very colorfully and would make a big show out of the presentation of her proposal. She was termed the queen of the corporate jungle. She was a truly a unique character. People like uh, John Chavadan, who is a retiree, but, you know, takes the public transportation to submit his proposals, really kind of a little bit of a different type of personality. James McCritchie, the young family, there's a lot of history. One thing that is worth mentioning, some of those proponents, the proposal business has been gone through a different generation, so father to son or father to daughter, and, it's, and basically those are kind of very... If you think about it in the context of the United States, when you have so many shareholders, it's almost quite surprising that you only see five to 10 of those people who are termed godflies and do that on a regular basis. But that's the reality. And what we have, what the project is really illuminates or underlines is the significant impact they have on the shaping of the corporate governance landscape through shareholder proposals, which is truly unique considering those are like just a handful of retail investors and the impact that they are making on multi-billion dollars companies. Part of your paper was an empirical project, and I wondered if you could discuss a little bit of what that research was. What data sources and methods did you use, and what research questions did you set out to answer with the empirical piece of this article? Surprisingly, there wasn't a lot of research on, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal discussion about gadflies and kind of the fact that they submit proposals and company don't like it. And Kobe and I both through our own work have kind of witnessed that, but there wasn't really a more comprehensive, wholesome type of research into the type of things that gadflies seek and the success rate and what happens with their proposals. So we really wanted to get a better understanding of the role of gadflies both in today's era, but also going back in time and kind of understanding how their role has evolved over the years. So we basically extracted data on all of the shareholder proposals that were submitted to the S&P 1500 companies starting in 2005 all the way to 2018. The bulk of the research was done during 2019. So um, 2018 was the last year we had uh, available data for. And we really wanted to look at the types of proposals that were submitted by different types of shareholders, including gadflies, the success rate they had, and also uh, the likelihood of implementation or management action on those proposals. And Kobe will give you some of the key results. But the goal was to really kind of look at that anecdotal sentiment that you can see in popular media and among some academics and see if that holds true when you look at the data itself. If I may add... Quickly, uh, two main questions in mind. In the past, those gadflies were perceived as a mere inconvenience, but there has been a significant change in the U.S. capital market with the rise of large institutional investors. And one of the questions we're interested in is what role, if at all, those gadflies play in this new world where you have the large, the titan of Wall Street, where BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street all together, uh, 20% of every large public corporation in the U.S. So what's the role of the gadflies, if at all, in this new corporate governance world, new ecosystem? And also, because uh, the SEC started to look at the question of shareholder proposals, and there were a lot of pushback against the fact that every shareholder who wants just a shares equal to $2,000 can submit a proposal to the company uh, that it created a disruption, etc. So we were also looking at it in light of that possible reform and try to see what type of implication we can have from this research on this policy move that, that was going on at the background. What were your key findings from that project? So we had a few major important findings from the project. 
A, we found that a large fraction of all shareholder proposals are submitted by five or six individuals, just to give you a sense. In 2018 alone, 40% of the proposals were submitted by five gadflies. So think about the large capital market in the work, the US, and shareholder proposal is an important tool, and five people are in charge of submitting a significant fraction of those proposals. There you can rightfully ask, okay, they submit a lot of proposals, but what happened with those proposals? Do they get any attention, traction from other shareholders? But interestingly, 26% of the proposals that they submit during the entire sample period that Yaron just mentioned, receive majority support. So one out of four proposals that they submit passed, basically. Even some of the proposals that do not pass, do not receive majority support, still receive significant support, say 40%, 30%. And we know for empirical data that that's enough, that's high enough to generate uh, some change. The other issue is that some people accused Godflies that they have a very narrow interest, that they have different interests from other shareholders. But when you look at the data, you see that most of the proposals they submit are the core of corporate governance issues, declassify the board, majority voting, proxy access. Those are not the esoteric topic that may interest an individual uh, shareholders. And lastly, uh, we find there is a question about the implementation of those proposals. So even if they receive majority support, there is a question what the company does with it. And we find that Godfrey's proposal has a relatively high implementation rate. 65% of their past proposals, the proposals that receive majority support, were followed by management proposals that in the vast majority of the cases was eventually implemented. So the impact of Godfrey's is real. With these empirical findings in mind, how does this paper inform or complicate our understanding of shareholder activism and shareholder participation in corporate governance, especially in light of these five or six individuals who submit many of the shareholder proposals versus perhaps institutional investors who might submit shareholder proposals? I think it's important to maybe be clear that gadflies present this complex question and Kobe just highlighted some of the interesting findings that we had, but it's also important to kind of contextualize their presence against the backdrop of lack of participation in the submission of shoulder proposals by larger institutional investors. So Godflies are performing an important service, and I think the findings show that unlike some of the myths that have been kind of present, they mostly do good. They mostly submit proposals that other shoulders like. They mostly get uh, a high support rates and their support, the proposals they do submit are likely to garner action from companies. But we are well aware and, and the project also highlights some of the concerns that we might have with resting our corporate governance system in the context of shareholder proposals in the hands of those individuals. And I think Kobe and I split it into two big buckets. The first one is there's just like structural limitations that Godflies face. They are individuals, they have limited financial ability, so that means that they are constrained in where and how many proposals they can submit. There's also a question of whether this is long-term tenable. A lot of them, as I said uh, in the beginning, is a family business that has been passed uh, from father to son or from mother to daughter, depending on the context here. But in any event, there's a question whether what happens when those godflies retire from their work as godflies. There's no clear line of succession here. And it's especially relevant if you talk about a handful of people. If a majority of them do not have relevant successors, that can have a significant impact on their role. And I think there's also concerns about the effectiveness of you know, by which they are doing their job. So we do see that they are doing relatively good job. The question is, are they doing the best that possibly could be done? And we have some questions now. For instance, although the majority of the cases that we have seen show that uh, Godfly's proposals are kind of geared towards the majority of shareholder interest, it's not to say that sometimes they don't pursue their own personal agenda in some of those proposals. Some of the Godflies are maybe less equipped than others to put proposals that are very good on the table. So sometimes there's issues of drafting or using templates that are not the best fit for each company. Again, that stems maybe with the financial uh, restrictions that they may have and the capacity they have. 
So all of those are concerns that you might have about kind of relegating the driving force of shadow proposals into the hands of a handful of individuals. And that's something that connects to the big question of why don't we see larger institutions involved in this process, uh, knowing that it has such a significant impact on how companies are governed. So as Iran just mentioned, the natural candidate for submitting those proposals are the large institutional investors. But when we look at the data, we see that they didn't submit even a single proposal. When we talk about the big three, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, those, for instance, Lucian Babchuk and Scott Hills uh, have shown they didn't submit even a single proposal during this period. Why there are uh, many explanations, uh, concerns from regulatory backlash or the unwilling uh, to confront with management. But for our purposes, what's really important is that in the end of the day, we have an ecosystem where the guideflies are the ones who are filling the void left by those large institutional investors, and they play an important role as the governance facilitators. They uh, bring those proposals, and once those proposals are on the ballot, large shareholders have to follow their guidelines and to vote in favor of those proposals, and that's how they create those changes. So whenever we think about regulatory changes that will make it hard for Godflies to submit those proposals, we have to see the whole picture and to think about this ecosystem and the role Godflies play in it. What key takeaways would you like our listeners to be thinking about from this conversation and from the article? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think that there is a short-term and long-term policy implication. In the short term, the SEC just recently passed a reform to show the proposal submission rules. This is something that was brewing as we wrote this paper and kind of passed uh, after our draft was completed. We revised the draft a little bit to kind of account for that. But I think our concern then and still is, is that the SEC is basically what we call is killing the messenger. Really, the way the SEC reform has been structured is by making it much more difficult for retail investors, small investors, just like gadflies, to be able to submit proposals to companies. Now, you may have concerns about gadflies efficiency, as we alluded to before, but what is happening right now is potentially just cutting the tree branch altogether, right? You remove the ability of gadflies to submit proposals or significantly reduce their ability to do so. And Kobe just explained that at this point in time, gadflies are the governance facilitators. They are the ones who put those proposals on the ballot and basically allow other institutional investors to support them and to make a difference in how corporate governance is being formulated in company. If you, like the SEC has just done, make it significantly difficult to uh, gadflies investors to submit those proposals, the question is, what happens in that void? And the concern that Kobe and I had in the paper is that we didn't see the big three or large institutional investors willing to do that. And there's no reason to think that this will change. So you might leave a void that's not going to be fulfilled unless you think about it more holistically, unless you address it in the ecosystem level. So that leads me to the second point, which is the long-term view. Really, if we understand that we have an issue here where we have a void in who submits proposals, relied on Galfa is doing it, maybe we can find a way to improve that aspect of putting proposals on the ballot. And Kobe and I put two distinct type of proposals, suggestions for a policy reform. The first one is kind of more uh, geared at what we call Godflies 2.0. Basically, we are saying, you know, maybe we can have some sort of nonprofit organization, some sort of a, a group that will be able to kind of improve on the shortcomings on Godflies, but still capture the essence of what they do by basically vetting proposals and submitting them on behalf of investors, both retail and large institutional investors. And that would allow for a similar governance facilitation role by uh, this kind of a, a nonprofit organization. I think the second point that Kobe and I wanted to advance is really thinking about short circuiting this whole concern of not having ability to have issues on the ballot and basically forcing companies to have a periodic vote on various governance considerations on a somewhat of a regular schedule, just like they, we do with say on pay. And that in a sense will remove the need to have Godflies serve as governance facilitators as we're just going to have a periodic vote on key governance provisions, allowing investors to really voice what they care about without the need for an individual to put a proposal on the ballot. 
Our guests today have been Kobe Castile, Assistant Professor of Law at Tel Aviv University, and Yaro Neely, Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Wisconsin. We've discussed their article, The Giant Shadow of Corporate Gadflies, which is forthcoming in the Southern California Law Review. I'll have a link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Kobe, your own, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Yes, always good to be on the podcast, Andrew. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.